much to Alex and his colleagues for putting together what I think is going to be a really interesting session over the course of this morning. I'm going to talk today about castles and cultural landscapes and studying cultural landscapes as a way to bridge the disciplinary divides between the study of landscapes and buildings. And I'm going to look at, at how cultural landscapes, how I'm studying cultural landscapes through the process of deep mapping. Deep mapping I'll introduce in a moment, but I find it, I'm sort of experimenting with it at the moment, and I'm finding it quite useful to overcome the conceptual and disciplinary divisions in the study of cultural landscapes. I'm going to start with, admittedly, an inconclusive overview of cultural landscapes to sort of have a look at how we got to this fragmented state, because I think sort of looking at how the study of cultural landscapes developed, the way to overcome the, that fragmentation emerges from that discussion. So cultural landscapes then can be considered the interface between nature and culture. So the interface between tangible and intangible heritage, the interface between natural and cultural diversity. So it's an interwoven set of relationships, the essence of culture and people's identity. In that way then, we can think of cultural landscapes as the fundamental link between humankind and its natural environments in the past, and local communities and their heritage in the present. And we're going to come back to this description at the end of the paper. So as I said, looking back at the development of cultural landscape studies, thinking promulgated by German geographers in the late 19th century really ignited the discussion of the study of landscapes as space shaped by people. And that was very much in opposition to the physical determinism school of geography at that time. This was followed by the development in, in, of buildings archaeology, which stemmed from architect, architecture, ethnology and art history, so quite separate um, to, uh, to the cultural turn in geography. And then from the 1990s onwards, really, there was a landscape turn in archaeology, and that sort of brought in lots of great knowledge on how communities have reacted to landscapes and how they have impacted landscapes. But really, all of these things sort of developed in isolation from one another, and what we're left with is separation, isolation, or sometimes unequal emphasis. And this is perpetuated which by what is sometimes, not across the board of course, but there is sometimes a communication gap between academic research and the heritage research. And this results in a number of lim limitations, of course. Many of you uh, in the papers today, I'm sure these will, the variety of limitations will be discussed. But from my point of view, as a buildings archaeologist who looks at medieval buildings at risk, particularly from climate change. The limitations include how this unequal emphasis impacts our preservation, our conservation and our climate change mitigation. So that is some of the issues that we're facing. But what really drew me to this session was how we can reconnect landscapes and buildings and how we can synchronise scholarship with public understanding. And I'm going to sort of talk about that through the prism of a case study. And the case study is uh, Donador Castle. More accurately, it's a late medieval Irish tower house. And it's located here in Cape Clare in County Cork. Cape Clare is an island off the west coast of County Cork. It's the most southerly occupied part of Ireland. It's about one hour away from the mainland. I'm from the exact opposite end of Ireland. So to me, it sort of feels like going to the very edge of Ireland. And this is what the, the castle, the tower house, looks like today as of this summer. And you can see why I really wanted to study this castle. It's precariously placed on this uh, short promontory. It's, um, it's isolated, it's unconsolidated. It's quite clearly at risk from the Atlantic and the associated storms, tidal surges, high winds, and so on and so forth. It was once connected to the mainland of Cape Clare, but the natural cause by collapse in the 1830s. Dunningwood Castle was built by the O'Driscolls along with a number of other tower houses in the area. The O'Driscolls derived from the Corkily, which is the second phrase there. The Corkily were a kingdom who were very prominent in the early medieval period in the West Cork area of Ireland. But over the course of the medieval period, the Corkily contracted and really their influence didn't extend far beyond West Cork after sort of the 7th century. In 1103, there's an analytic reference to an O'Driscoll who was king of the Corkily at this time, the early 12th century. But from sort of the high medieval to the late medieval period, the O'Driscolls also contracted and their influence really only extended 
um, throughout this West Cork area and less so um, throughout Ireland. So Dun and Dun and Or Castle means golden fort. Dun means fort, and this tentatively suggests that it was built on on the site of an earlier promontory fort. Um, but I'll come back to to shortly. So you can see in this, in this image of the tower house, it's the southeast extent has collapsed. There is a small part of the tower here, very little that it is remaining. Here you can see quite beautifully preserved a mural staircase, so a stair set within uh, the thickness of the walls. In this image side, you can see on the second floor there's a stone built roof and there's parts of the wall walk extant in some places. Back to the first image, you can see there's a currently preserved bond, so they're extending away from the island on this side, and there's a smaller bond on the eastern side of, of the tower house there. So done in or sort of the summary, you can see um, from the hashers the, the cliff edge is encroaching on the castle, parts of it are starting to collapse into the sea, such as the, the extent of the wall there on the north. Um, there's the tower house there, the extent of the ball, the smaller bottom. There's a number of other small buildings, parts um, extant above ground. There's a, a well embrasure and an oven. So bits and pieces are surviving. For those of you who are aware of the archaeology of medieval Ireland, and I see some Irish colleagues here today, you may know that tower houses are incredibly commonplace in Ireland. So this tower house isn't necessarily architecturally significant, so why am I talking to you about it today? Firstly, it's because it's incredibly at risk. This is at risk of falling into the sea in the next couple of decades or more collapsing into the sea. But it's also really interesting in how it relates to the wider cultural landscape. And my method of, of surveying this castle, trying to understand this castle, I'm using the process of deep mapping. I have to admit deep mapping, it's not new nor necessarily innovative. It's essentially a GIS that can hold a variety of data, so maybe around 100 different data sources for one site. Um, it's essentially a method or an approach to try and include as many different views and different perspectives of a site over um, a deep time perspective. But my, my enthusiasm for using deep mapping for this, for this particular castle was because I wanted to use a citizen science approach. I wanted to include the community of Cape Fair Island and integrate their viewpoints, their perspectives, and also their research questions into the project. And I wanted to do so while fully embracing interdisciplinarity. Thirdly, though, I wanted to create an online resource whereby people could vi digitally visit the site, which is no longer physically accessible. So as I said, a deep map can hold a variety of sources. So some of the more traditional sources that one would use when uh, examining a building, some cartographic examples. I really like this. This is one of the more beautiful cartographic references to Cape Clear. This is a Dutch map from 1612 which includes navigational instructions to seek out the pirate havens of Cape Clear as translated from Old Dutch there by Kelleher. And you can see our island of Cape Clear in the depiction of the castle and that entire area is called Roaring Water Bay. Other 17th century sources, there's another reference to Cape Clear on an anglicised Dun and Orr. And here at the level of the town land, there's the depiction of Cape Clare would be more like a castle than a tower house, um, and other references to uh, early medieval sites within the, within the island. And here in the land terrier, it says that Dunnamore was in um, was occupied by Thai O'Driscoll, so remaining in the O'Driscoll family who built it some 300 years prior to this 17th century source. But thinking about deep mapping and the ability to pull in lots of different sources and thinking about embracing interdisciplinarity, I wanted to look at some different sources which reference Cape Clear um, and the Roaring Water Bay area. There's this poem from the, the 19th century which, which says, Oh my grass of Gascadian. And that's um, a word which derives from the 13th century describing the water of Roaring Water Bay. Um, so that actually predates the, the, the term predates the building of the castle. And also this 18th century reference that described visiting the castle of Dunnanor as resisting not alone the fury of the elements, but also defying the aggressive attacks of the human foes. And I'm really fond of it because the weather is absolutely the same, but the people of Cape Clare are nothing but warm, I'm sure you. So the reason I was really keen to use deep mapping and pull in all these different sources 
was because it democratizes data. So it doesn't sort of push any one narrative whenever you collate all these sources. So from the building surveys, the land surveys, the maps, the, the poetry, the information on natural diversity, it treats all of that information as the same. So as a research tool, that forces me to um, step outside my bias and not only sort of focus on the fabric, on the elevation drawings, and as a buildings archaeologist, that's what I'm sort of want to do. Um, but it, so as a research tool, it forces one out of, out of their comfort zone. And as an output then, whenever this is all online and all these sources are, are digitally accessible, it doesn't push one narrative to the digital visitor. So the digital visitor will be able to create their own narratives through this amount of, of democratized data. So it's ontologically flat in a way. And a way that to sort of demonstrate how this has pushed me out of my, my comfort zone, I'll talk about some of the other castles built by the Odriscolls. Um, I think there's around 12 that they've built in the Roaring Water Bay, which is this entire area on the coast of West Cork. Um, and some of the castles, here's Dunmishad, the largest of their castles, Dundalong on the top left. That's our castle, Dunnanower, and we also built Dundagall. So all of four of their 12 castles use this word Dun, which means fort, which indicates that, in, that they may have been built on the site of an earlier palm tree fort. But what's really interesting through pulling together all this information, the place name evidence suggests <coughs> there could be earlier forts here. Um, but the archaeology, the archaeological evidence, there's not, there's no archaeological evidence for any of these four castles having been built on an earlier site. Although there is some tentative evidence for Dunnashod, but that's the only one. So instead of weighing that up, but then we bring in the oral histories as well, and the people of Cape Clear that I've been working with um, on the case of Dunnor are adamant that it was built on the earlier on the site of an earlier promontory that was built by the Corkily, who were that larger kingdom from the early medieval period. So it's really interesting democratizing data and giving equal emphasis to all of these things. It feels um, like a bit of an experiment, really. So democratizing data, it really it aims to force in different perspectives. And it's a reminder that individuals experience places in varied and multiple ways. And encourages you to include all that in the research process. And while in a, a, a GIS platform, we can't include the extent of the complexity of any site across time, but it does give a renewed sense of the depth of meaning through this process of democratization. So in summary, this process of deep mapping, I think actively reconnects buildings and cultural landscapes in research. And just calling back to the development of the discipline of cultural landscape studies from, from earlier in the paper, how does deep mapping relate to that? And I think really it's a process of, of pulling in multidisciplinary sources in a way which reduces the likelihood of bias or disciplinary favoritism. So for myself, not focusing on the extant fabric of the building, but thinking sort of more outside the box. And I want to close now with just turning back to the description of cultural landscapes as the fundamental link between humankind and its natural environments in the past. And I want to just, uh, what I said earlier about there being many tower houses in Ireland, and although this has never really been said, but in some of the earlier studies that focus just on the fabric of Dunnanor Castle, there tends to be a, um, an undertone of, it's just another tower house. And I find that by sort of zooming in and really embracing the depth of the cultural landscape, it steps out, it forces us to step outside that and not regard it as just another tower house. We have so many of them, lots of them are in ruined condition, but really it provides a much more enhanced understanding of our past. Likewise then, cultural landscapes as the link between local communities and their heritage in the present. And this is what I really like about this castle. On one hand, we have a castle that has been possibly overlooked by the archaeological sector, the heritage sector, and in academic research. But on the other hand, the castle and its cultural landscapes have in no way been overlooked by the local community. This is a picture from an early O'Driscoll gathering in the 1960s. So this is where all the, the contemporary O'Driscoll clan meet in the area of Roaring Water Bay for an annual meeting. So people with the start name O'Driscoll and its derivatives. Um, and this is an annual event that still takes place today. And I was chatting to some of the people who, who go along to this and on one of their recent 
recent heritage trails of this annual meeting, they went to all the castles, that uh, all the O'Driscoll castles, including Dunnanore. So they're still reenacting the relationship and performing the relationship between the castles and the cultural landscape. So to them, it hasn't been overlooked at all. So I'm going to close on that point then. And in conclusion, while there may be too much space between buildings and cultural landscape in the heritage sector and in academic research, it's clear that that isn't the case within the local communities. It's they're constantly reenacting and performing this relationship. So in order for us to reconnect castles and landscapes and to synchronize scholarship with public understanding, I suggest we begin by stepping outside of our disciplinary and academic boundaries. Thank you.